Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Brother Daniel. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Welcome to the Pentecostals of Lee Road for 930 Christian Education. I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad to have our young people with us this morning. Uh, they are in here uh, instead of their normal class because tomorrow night is our annual sectional minister's banquet and it's being hosted here uh, more uh, specifically next door in our youth sanctuary so uh, I don't know why our young people were not trusted to not mess with all the tables and the flowers and all the pretty arrangements and everything I think they were uh, probably well capable of no nah, they, they weren't uh, love y'all anyway but we thought it, that's right we thought it, it wiser to <clears throat> have everyone here together this morning so thank you for being here uh, what great weather we're having. I love this touch of fall. Fall is in the air. God is, God is good. And uh, I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord today. Bishop is here. I'm excited to hear him preach the word of the Lord today. God is going to do some great things. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. Can we bow our heads and just go to the Lord in prayer? Father, I thank you so much for your awesome, awesome presence. Lord, we already feel it here today. I thank you for what's happened this week. I thank you for the good things that have taken place. I thank you, Lord, for even the challenges that we've had that allowed you to, to show us your glory and to answer our prayers, and I thank you for that. I pray you bless this time together. Bless your word. Help us to learn something from you, from each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Of course, I honor our bishop and Sister Donna. Sister Donna, of course, is in Singapore with Pastor Greg. And then this week, Sister Nikki and Sister Lisa will be heading over there. But we got some, Pastor Greg was texting us some pictures, sending us some pictures this morning of some, uh, some folks that uh, I actually got to go to Singapore in 2002, so going back 13 some odd years. And... Uh, texting me some pictures of some, some, some of the Singaporean church members there that were teenagers when 13 years ago. And uh, it's just awesome to, to know that even 10,000 miles away on the other side of the world, God is still just as real. His presence is still just as awesome. It, he answers the, the prayers just like he does here. He, he hears our prayers. He's the same God for the, the Chinese people as he is for the Americans. He's the same God for the Africans as he is for the Canadians. God is just, he's no respecter of persons. It's, he's just an incredible God. And the more you get, dig into his word and the more you uh, get to know him, to know him is to know his word and vice versa. You can't separate God from his word. To know God, the more you get to know the Lord, uh, just the, the, the deeper and the more infinite he becomes. There's just nothing like it. And there's... Um, the more you read the Bible, you'll, you'll see that there's, I just, I'll describe it as layers of Scripture. You know, the Bible's message is applicable and understandable by our kids. I, I have a five-year-old, and he's learning Scripture. He understands what is being taught in Sunday school. The, narrative of the, the narratives of the, the Bible are being shared in a way that kids can understand it. But as you grow older and no matter how many times you read the Bible, you can read this book a hundred times from cover to cover, and on the hundred and first time, you'll discover something different. You'll discover something deeper. You'll discover a new uh, attribute about God, or you'll, you'll have a, a firmer understanding, and it's, it's just how it is. So this morning, we're going to talk about the armor of God, and we all have heard that before, I'm sure. If not, you'll hear it today, but what I hope is that maybe as we do this survey or this uh, study of the armor of God that maybe we 
dig a little bit deeper into a, a, a layer of that that maybe we haven't thought about before. Uh, at best, this will be edifying for you. At worst, maybe it will be just interesting, some interesting information, but I hope you get something out of this. And um, it, it's very applicable to the, these days, this day and hour. We are, we are in a spiritual battle. It's, it's not ending. If anything, it's intensifying, and that's, that's scriptural. That's expected so much the more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So we have to understand what's happening. We have to understand how to uh, equip ourselves uh, according to the word of God. Six years ago, almost, almost exactly six years ago, on November 11th, 2009, the video game called Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 was released, and in five days it had grossed over half a billion dollars in sales. As of January 2010, it had made over, over one billion dollars worldwide. There's just something about warfare that is intriguing. It's something uh, about being in the action in, in the act that, that just is profitable for video game manufacturers, among others. That's a lot of people participating in video game warfare. And there's been many more since this game was released. And that's, it's one of the most popular genres of, of video games. Popular, of course, among teenagers, but there's even more adults that play video games these days than teenagers. You wouldn't think that but that's the case unfortunately we don't live in a fairy tale world where warfare is a game it's not really a game and uh, in a game the only consequences are that you have to start over at the beginning of the level that is not the case in real life warfare there are also a lot of people participating in real life or death physical warfare too all across the world groups of people are at war with other groups of people and when you study history, it's amazing how much of history can be defined in the context of who was fighting who at a particular time. It's amazing how much uh, our, our society, even today, is shaped by the events of warfare. More than any other event, warfare has shaped what our country is today. Even hundreds of years later, we're still debating and reading about famous battles and battlefields and their ramifications and the results, such as the Battle of Gettysburg. Picture number two. Hundred and fifty some odd years ago to something more recent, the jungles of Vietnam. Next picture. And then, of course, in our very, very modern era, something our young people have even, uh, can be, even be familiar with is the fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan from people that we know, even from, from some in this church have experienced that. Harsh and decisive battles that altered the course of human history have been fought on the land, in the air, and even at sea. The point is it's all encompassing. Warfare is all encompassing in every terrain, everywhere you go. There's, a, there's a, a battle plan, there's a, a, a plan or a, a, an attack mode, a tactic to get the battle to that area. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, in the morning before D-Day, addressed the troops before they invaded, and he said this. He said, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you, the hopes and prayers of liberty Loving people everywhere march with you. Your task will not be easy. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped, and battle hardened. He will fight savagely. But our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. Wars have been fought on foreign soil as well as our own. Police have waged other types of war, such as the war on crime and war on drugs. Politicians like to talk about the war on poverty. We use that word a lot. Warfare comes in all shapes and sizes and types and can come from any direction at any time. Wars are made up of battles, and battles are by nature made up of violence. There's just no other way to describe it. Warfare is violent. Listen to this eyewitness testimony of a girl named Crystal Woodman who is lucky to be alive today 
after living through a violent battle of a kind that was unheard of until this particular event. Of course, this weekend, uh, or Friday, I believe it was, in Oregon, we witnessed yet another mass school shooting. This one in Columbine was one of the first, the first major one. She said, I was there. It was not a battlefield that most would expect, perhaps the most unlikely place for a war to occur, yet the most real and evident example of modern-day spiritual warfare. She said, a small library tucked inside a typical suburban school called Columbine, the high school now famous for the most terrifying school shooting in the United States history that was up until this time. I remember it clearly, a battle against innocent students where lives were ended, our sense of security stripped away, and the lives of countless families changed forever. As a junior in high school, I entered the library that day, not knowing it could be the last day of my life. When the two boys, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, entered the room with the intent to kill using their guns and bombs, I clung to two other friends praying, waiting to die. She said, I will never forget when my friend told me that he would take a bullet for me. It was at that moment I vowed to serve the Lord with all of my heart from then on. Up until then, I wasn't living like a believer. She said, in fact, up until that point, I had tried everything to fill the void within my life. For several months, I had been living a double life as a Christian but also as a person still craving the world. But that day changed everything. While I hid under the table in the Columbine Library, a battle was raging around me and within me, a battle to choose once and for all who I would serve. I chose Jesus Christ. After seven minutes of sheer terror, the two boys who stood above our table were talking about leaving to reload their guns. It was then they left that we got up, to escape and surveyed the damage of the room. Smoke filled the air. Glass and books were thrown all over and bodies were strewn everywhere. I was there, a survivor of tragedy and pain. Because I was there, I can share with you a lesson I learned, a lesson of urgency. We do not know what lies ahead, she said, but we do know that God has a unique purpose for each of our lives. We also know that Satan wants to do whatever he can to distract us from Jesus. As young people... She said, we constantly face this threat of spiritual warfare in this world. We must choose which kind of movies we will watch, the music we will listen to, and the life we will live. Satan's toys and temptations have the potential to tear us away from what really matters in life, that is knowing Christ and making him known through word and action. May the world around you see the light within you so they can experience victory in Jesus who has already defeated the evil one through his blood shed for you and me. As Christians, we are engaged in warfare. It's not a physical warfare as, as took place here, and it may eventually get that way. I hope not. But uh, more importantly, the spiritual warfare. The spirit world is even more real than the physical world. We have to understand that. And, and the spiritual warfare that is raging is only intensifying in this late hour. It shouldn't be a surprise to, to you to note that the Bible, uh, mostly the Apostle Paul, used words such as war and battle very, very frequently in the New Testament. He used it to describe what happens not in the physical world, but in the spiritual world, in your spiritual world, in my spiritual world, in the world that we live in. We can't escape the spiritual world. We may not be aware of it at all times, but it's there. It's there. And as I said, it's even more real and affects more than even the physical world does. We cannot escape this spiritual battlefield, and it's in particularly our minds. Matthew even said in Matthew 11 and 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. We see this, this warfare terminology all throughout the New Testament. You may connect the dots already. On Wednesday nights, our prayer meeting, our corporate prayer meeting, we call war on the floor. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual warfare. John the Baptist's job was to prepare the way for the Messiah, for Jesus Christ. He was to, to almost pioneer. He was to, to infiltrate, if you will, uh, enemy territory and, and prepare the way and say, okay, Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. He's coming after me. And he said, the kingdom suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What he was saying was, it's not going to be an easy fight. There's going to be some spiritual warfare taking place. There's going to be some things that we have to be aware of that we're going to come up against. There's going to be some, some oppression. There's going to be some, some opposition to what we're trying to accomplish here. 
as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1 and 18, this is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. In his next letter to Timothy, he wrote, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. If you're in the kingdom of God, there's no way to escape it. We are soldiers in the army of the Lord. Whether we realize it or not, whether we like to think about it this way or not, we've been enlisted in God's army, and violent spiritual battle is unavoidable. We feel it every day, whether we acknowledge it as such or not. When we wake up, are we going to serve the Lord or are we not? Are we going to be disciplined or are we not? Are we going to treat others the way Jesus said to treat them or are we not? Are we going to make the right decision and and prioritize uh, the things of God or are we not? Constantly, daily decisions. It's it's warfare. What are we going to do? It's it can be very violent in the spirit as well. There's there's we don't always see it, but it's there. Just like a good army would not send its soldiers out to battle without proper protection from the enemy or without sufficient weapons and ammunition to attack the enemy. Our God has provided us with everything we need to defend ourselves as well as what we need to be victorious on any battlefield, at any time, at any season of our lives, regardless of what's going on during any mission. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And he goes on to say how we do that. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles meaning uh, the deception. We've got to be aware. We've got to understand what's going on in the spirit world. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is not so much a physical thing as it is a spiritual thing. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, because of all this, because of the battle that we're entrenched in, take up the whole armor of God. Verse 11 said, put on the whole armor of God. Verse 13 says, take up the whole armor of God. There's a distinction here between just some of the armor and all of the armor. He says, we've got to have it all. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The disciples at that time felt that they were in the evil day. Guess what? It's only <laughs> we are also in the evil day. There were bad things going on there as well, but at the same time, when we look around, it's an evil day. Uh, I heard something, uh, a professor talking about Adam and Eve and and Cain and Abel. You know, there were four people on the earth at that time, and uh, he said, we got to understand the murder rate was 25% back in the day. So when we think we have it bad, yes, we do, but there's always been bad things. The first family had a child kill his brother. But comparatively, look at where we are now and how the the ebbs and flows of society and and there's really no denying. I think we would all be in agreement that we're in an evil day. We're in an evil day. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Put on the whole armor of God. Every single piece is absolutely essential. Every one of these six pieces of armor, spiritual armor that Paul wrote about, is absolutely necessary to stand 
and to be victorious in this day and hour, in this spiritual battle that we cannot avoid. The battle is not physical, but it is spiritual. The principality, that word principality means a state or place ruled by a prince. The devil is called the prince and the power of the air. And that is, of course, our adversary. We're in a war with Satan and his satanic forces that rule this world. Notice, there are offensive weapons such as a sword, but also defensive weapons such as a shield and a helmet. There are basically two parts to this spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. There's offense and there's defense, and we are always in the middle of one of the two. We're always either defending against a spiritual attack or we're on the offensive against a spiritual attack. There's no, there's no bench in this game. There's no one on the bench waiting to get into the game. We're all on the field in this battle. There's no reserves. We're, we're all it. We're all in, and we're what, we're what God has, has saved for the last days. He trusts us that much to, to save the best for last, to save the, the, the last major offensive, just like General Eisenhower in D-Day. He was the, the last push, the do or die. It's going to work, or we're, we're history. Guess what? We, it works. We work with the power of God. We're victorious, but, but the battle is still there. While we're still in this world, though we are not of this world, we are still fighting a battle in the spiritual realm. The fight is relentless. It is relentless. Day after day, this battle rages. We have to understand this whole armor of God, what each piece is, what it means, and how do we make sure that we have it on every single day. Romans 13 and 12 says this, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. It means the day is now. Like it, the time is now. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. It takes the whole armor in order to stand. That word stand that Paul wrote, that he used, means to, to, to establish, to make firm, to make sure, to have sure footing. Piece number one, the belt of truth. Now, it's okay to laugh at some of these pictures uh, in all the research that I did. Um, some of them are I found quite humorous, but the belt or the girdle or the sash was always with the ancients and was an important part of their dress at all times. Okay, so the, some of these pictures are what Paul had in mind when he wrote this, when he drew this symbolism between uh, the, the physical armor and the spiritual armor that we have to have. Even in times of peace, people would wear a belt or a sash, much probably like you know, we have a 21st century belt, and, and it, it keeps everything together. They wore loose, flowing robes, and it was necessary to gird them up when they traveled, ran, or labored. The belt was the place where they carried their money, their sword, their writing instruments, everything that was important, that's where they carry there. Think of, uh, for our young people, think of Batman. Everything was connected to the belt in some form or fashion, right? For the chase, the police officer, everything is is centered on the belt. You got your cuffs, your gun, your taser, your nightstick. Everything is is connected to the belt, right? So uh, this is what went around the very center of the warrior's body. It could be made of many different things and materials, even iron or steel. Some of which had uh, very detailed or intricate designs on them. I've got a couple pictures of of this. If you want to show the next one, it's particularly uh, interesting. There may be some Photoshop involved with that one there. But it's just to give you an indication of what some of the variations of this. this it wasn't a, a, an inch wide uh, leather belt that we're referring to here. This is something that, that covered the whole midsection. Uh, the armor belt was important for, for a number of reasons. Number one, it protected the midsection and thus protected what was required for a warrior to have a family and carry on his legacy. This was not this, this spiritual battle. We're not just fighting for ourselves or for our present. Should the Lord tarry, we're fighting for our future. We're fighting for our kids. We're fighting for our children. I want them to have uh, an understanding of what it means to be victorious. I want them to know that they can live above sin, that they don't have to fall into temptation and suffer the consequences of that. So the, the belt, this belt of truth protects that. Number two, it provided support around the center of the body which in essence supported the whole body. If your core, if you work out or anything, unlike me, they, but I've heard about it, <laughs> I read about it, 
few times I go to the gym, you see posters about it. Your core. There's core workouts. You know, that's the center. That's working on the muscles that protect your posture and protect the center of your body. It's your, your, your abs and your, your lower back and those muscles around the center of your frame that help you stand upright. That's what the belt did. That's what the, the sash did, the girdle. It, it protected what was around the center. It protected and supported the center of the body. And in doing so, supported the whole body. Number three, it was designed to keep all the other pieces of armor in place to gird the soldier on every side. It secured the rest of the armor around the warrior. We are to have our loins gird about with truth. The whole armor of God and the, the part of the armor that holds all the other armor in place and secures the very center of the body is truth. The truth of the word of God. The loins encircled by the girdle from the form the central point, the central point of the physical system. In scripture, the loins are described as the seat of power. To smite through the loins is to strike a fatal blow. To lay affliction upon the loins is to afflict heavily. Here was the point of junction for the main pieces of the body armor. Think about it. The breastplate was secured to the, the, the belt. The, the greaves at the, the bottom, the, we'll get to those in a minute, they were secured. Everything was kind of connected and flowed from that center point. The truth this belt of truth is that Jesus Christ is God. We have to be founded on that. That has to be the center of our, our very lives, that Jesus is God and serving him is the most important thing that there is. That knowledge of what is true is our center, it's our core, it's what keeps us girded about and supported when everything else is shaky. We've always got the belt of truth around us. It braces us. It protects our future. It's easier to stand and walk upright when we have the support of truth, when we have something we know is a firm foundation that we can stand on. It's easier to stay straight if our center is supported. The Bible says, know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth around our center is what gives us balance in life. We've got to have the truth of God. Piece number two, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate is the armor that covered the body from the neck to the thighs and consisted of two parts, one covering the front and the other the back. It was made of rings or in the form of scales or plates. There are a variety of uh, things about this. Next picture, please. Um, they were was supposed to be flexible. The whole point of the breastplate was that it would be flexible. It was not usually not one big cast iron uh, sheet of metal that was uh, designed to be a little bit a little bit flexible obviously there was some constraint there but not only flexible but guard the body from a sword spear or arrow it is referred to in the scriptures as a coat of mail or bre a breastplate we are told that Goliath's breastplate weighed 5,000 shekels of brass or nearly in their modern terms 160 pounds it was often formed of plates of brass laid upon one upon another like the scales of a fish like so. The breastplate was important for a number of reasons. Number one, it protected the vital organs such as the heart and lungs. Number two, it had to be strong enough to protect the soldier from spears and arrows and such and also as flexible as possible so that he could move around. It covered, number three, it covered the front and the back. Warfare at this, point, at this time was obviously a 360 degree affair. So you didn't want to have just your chest cover but you got to have your back you could get an enemy's dart could get to your heart from the back just as easily as it could from the front it is the breastplate of righteousness the word righteousness in this context applies implies the principle and practice of righteousness righteousness is being right in God's eyes being in in right standing with the Lord righteousness in God's eyes is 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 manifested by being holy in his eyes God said be ye holy for I am holy righteousness here encompasses Holiness, being holy and righteous before God. The principle of righteousness. Why would it be a breastplate of righteousness? Because the principles of righteousness and holiness is a heart issue. It's implanted in the heart. It's something that we, we hold in the, the deepest part of us. It's a holy life depends entirely on what is in our hearts. True righteousness and holiness is always an issue of the heart. One scholar said this, As the breastplate defends the heart and lungs and all those vital functionaries, that are contained in what is called the region of the thorax, so this righteousness, this life of God and the soul of man defends everything on which the man's spiritual existence depends. While he possesses this principle and acts from it, 
his spiritual and eternal life is secure. Doesn't scripture say out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and how we speak and act and, and, and all of those things reveals what's really in our hearts? Righteousness is a heart issue. But the way your righteousness is revealed is through the holiness of God that is revealed in your life. How we treat other people, how we speak, how we act, how we carry ourselves. The holiness of God that we exhibit is the outward reflection of the righteousness of God within us. The breastplate protects my heart from the enemy's arrows of unrighteousness. Just as the lines of holiness and the separation from what we call the world protects our heart which protects the righteousness of God in us that is our driving factor to please him and to fulfill this mission in the end times. What happens when we neglect holiness and righteousness and we we stop really trying to live with the priority of pleasing God at at the first, as our first priority? We, We essentially take off that breastplate of righteousness. It feels free. It feels unencumbered. Now we can move. We can do whatever we want. We're not restrained by any type of moral law. We're not restrained by anything, uh, any law of God that we're trying to abide by. So at first, of course, it feels free. But what, what we've done is just open ourselves up. We've opened our heart. We've exposed our heart. We've made our heart vulnerable to the enemy. We may still be able to live with a, a fiery dart that gets through. But every time you try to take a deep breath of the Holy Ghost, there's discomfort in it doesn't quite feel like it used to. And then maybe another one pierces from the back or from the side and it gets, gets one of our vital organs or maybe a lung. And this time we're having, now we're having trouble breathing normally at all, spiritually speaking, of course, from day to day. Have you ever gotten to that point where, you, 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 man, it's just hard to, you just feel like you're, it's hard to live for God on, on a particular day. Maybe you're having a rough week. Maybe you've made some mistakes. Maybe you've let down some lines in your life and it's just, man, one of those get in that state where it's like I can't even spiritually speaking I'm having trouble breathing I'm having trouble enjoying this life and life more abundantly I'm struggling to make it I'm I'm trying to survive instead of thrive the enemy can see you struggling and that you can't keep up with the fight and you can't keep up with your comrades in arms because you can't breathe right and you've become your breathing has become very shallow but spiritually speaking this is manifested when we become shallow in the spirit we can't reach the depths of the Holy Ghost that we once could where we don't really long or thirst after that any longer all because we felt a little too restricted in the breastplate of righteousness we got to make sure that we keep this breastplate of righteousness on us this is our main protection for our heart in this very very unavoidable and powerful and strong spiritual battle falling away from the Lord is not usually a quick thing it starts with a weakening in the armor a weakening in the desire to live righteously in God's eyes and a blurring of the lines of holiness in our lives. And when that happens, it's almost inevitable. There's nothing sadder than someone who is only covered halfway. There's two pieces to this breastplate of righteousness, the front and the back. Someone who looks the part from the front but doesn't live it from all the other angles in their lives is, is not what we want to be either. I don't want to put on a front, so to speak, with just half of the breastplate of righteousness. Piece number three, the boots of preparation of the gospel of peace. The shoes or boots or what was called greaves uh, were absolutely essential pieces of armor to the ancient warrior. They protected the feet. Got some pictures here. Protected the feet and legs up to the bottom of the armor belt. Often overlooked, this important piece of armor played a key role to the warrior. If the feet or legs were wounded, guess what? He couldn't stand couldn't move he couldn't walk he couldn't run he really couldn't fight he couldn't pursue the enemy in battle nor could he flee from the enemy if that became necessary yeah this is my favorite picture of of the greaves what did the boots of preparation do on a practical level number one they protected not only the feet of the warrior but also his legs Number two, many of them were made with spikes protruding out of them so that if necessary, the feet and legs could be used as weapons in close quarter combat. Number three, they were fastened on on and in place. It signaled, when they were fastened and in place, it signaled that the individual wearing them was ready and prepared for battle. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace means that you have prepared yourself 
for spiritual battle. It means you're not going into this with your eyes closed. It means you are aware of what's going on and that you have done what you could do to be prepared for it. We cannot forget this piece of armor. It's possible to have the power and the knowledge of truth. It's possible to have your armor belt on. It's possible to be pure and holy before God, have the breastplate of righteousness on. Maybe all the other pieces too, but if we don't put on the boots of the preparation of the gospel of peace, we're not fully prepared for the spiritual battle. We have to be ready to go anywhere or do anything in this spiritual battle. This preparation is necessary for this reason. In order to function in peace in the midst of a battle, we got to be prepared to do so. Not being prepared to function in peace means we are paralyzed by fear. We can't move if our feet are not prepared. We're paralyzed. We're stuck. We can't move. The only way to have peace in the midst of this battle is to be prepared. We have to be ready to fight constantly. The only way to relieve anxiety and fear before a big test, they tell us, is to study and to prepare. Not a coincidence, Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. Study the word. You've got to be prepared. You've got to know. Why is it important to be prepared? Because preparation breeds confidence. We cannot be Christians in this day and age, in this battle, in this spiritual battle, that lack confidence, that don't know how to act, that don't know what to do, that are worried and cower in fear. That is not the will of God. God believes in preparation. Jesus himself prepared 30 years for a three and a half year earthly ministry, not the other way around. That's how much God believed in preparation. Piece number four, the shield of faith. Now, Paul wrote and said, above all, the shield of faith. Now, he wasn't saying that's the most important or that's the, the, the most valuable piece. It is, but he, he wasn't. That word above all means over all. As the soldier holds his shield to defend himself all around, 360 degrees, when the shield was attached to his arm, it would defend up here, below, on this side, even the back, this side, over all, above all, the shield of faith. Number one, it provided 360 degrees of protection. Number two, it protected not only the soldier himself, but also the other pieces of armor. The shield of faith was that important, as is our faith in this day and hour. Number three, it was designed to cause the enemy's arrows to glance off. The shield of faith constitutes protection over every part of the soldier's body because it can be turned in every direction. I won't spend a whole lot of time on the shield of faith. There's, there's books that have been written of just about the shield of faith. It's, it, if you ever want something interesting to study, study this concept of the shield of faith and the process that they would go to. I believe a few weeks ago, Pastor Jason preached about the shield of faith and how they would anoint with oil before battle. And what that would do was cause the enemy's arrows to either glance off or what's called the fiery darts, the arrows that were lit on fire, if they stuck, they would be quenched because of that oil that was anointing that shield. Not a coincidence that Paul says the enemy shoots fiery darts of temptation at us. And the, it's our faith that quenches those fiery darts. Temptations come at you suddenly like arrows shot from an enemy soldier. They come from unexpected places. They pierce and penetrate and torment the soul as arrows would that are on fire. And they set the soul on fire and kindle the worst kinds of passion. Sin brings out the worst in humanity. The small foxes spoil the vine. That's what scripture says. Because sin starts small, it starts with a thought that eventually leads to an action. Remember, sin grows. It's progressive. There's no such thing as a little sin. It may start off, but it, it grows. The devil's not satisfied with just a little piece of your life. He wants it all. Just as a, a fiery dart was supposed to not just burn a little spot on the enemy soldier it was supposed to stick and then catch everything else on fire until it was all consumed the shield of faith is necessary because when the battle is raging it's the only thing that can save and protect us and the rest of our armor we've got to hold on to our faith we've got to hold on to our shield of faith it is all encompassing it covers every area and every aspect of our lives it is preserved with frequent anointing piece number five the helmet of salvation the helmet was originally made of skin strengthened with bronze or other metal and surmounted with a figure adorned with a horsehair crest as in that picture there it quickly evolved into being made mostly of metal usually furnished with a visor to protect the face 
such as that. Many, many variations of, of battle helmets. But what did this do? Number one, it protected the head, obviously. But number two, not only did it protect the head, but it protected the eyes and the face. Number three, it also signaled to the enemy exactly who or what the soldier was fighting for. Those feathers or the, the design of the, the uh, fur or whatever they put on it, however they adorned the helmet, signaled why that soldier was fighting and who or what he was fighting for. The helmets very often were adorned with feathers or engraved with a crest that referenced and announced what they were fighting for. Protection for the head, of course, from all angles. The head, the soldier, uh, the, the helmet accomplished that. One stroke to the head obviously could be fatal, but salvation is our helmet in this spiritual battle. It's the helmet of salvation. Without something protecting our eyes, our ears, and our minds, what becomes vulnerable? Our salvation, our status with the Lord. 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away from their ears, their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. What goes in your eyes and ears doesn't stop there. It goes into your brain where it is processed. Being saved, washed by the blood of Jesus and filled with his spirit gives us the strength and the ability to protect our minds. Battle starts in the mind. That's why Paul said, whatsoever things are pure, honest, holy, just, etc. Think on these things. Think on these things. It's important what's in your mind. It's important how you think. We have to protect our minds. When your eyes and ears go unguarded or unprotected, our minds are unprotected. And one blow, one seed of false doctrine that we, we grab onto will get into our spirit and get into our hearts and affect our status in this battle. An unprotected mind will eventually lead to an unprotected spirit. An unprotected mind will eventually lead to an unprotected spirit. Finally, piece number six, the sword of the spirit. Though there were many types of weapons used in the battlefield, the weapon of choice because of its effectiveness and capability, of course, was the sword. Swords came in all shapes and sizes. Swords were made of strong metal that were beaten, fired, shaped and then sharpened the sword of course was important for a number of reasons number one it was the primary offensive weapon that a soldier used of course as we said he could use the the greaves on his feet he could use the shield as a weapon at, at some times he could use uh, the helmet even in close quarter combat but the primary offensive weapon was the sword it could be carried and attached to the soldier at all times even when not directly in use coincidentally or not coincidentally attached to the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit. Number three, the soldier had to be trained to use it. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. That's what scripture says. Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than, than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The enemy that we are fighting every day cannot stand up against the word of God. It is that simple. You cannot depend on someone else in the battle to use their sword to protect you. They may from time to time. That's what really what happens every Sunday. We hear uh, someone preach about the word of God and expound on the deep truths of the word of God and that, in, that empowers us and it edifies us and we, 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 we leave feeling uh, encouraged and, and strengthened for the fight. But... We don't come to church every day. <laughs> We're not together every single day. At some point, we've got to be trained to fight on this battlefield. We're on the battlefield anyway. We've got to know how to use our sword. We've got to know, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We've got to know uh, all of the, the scriptures. We've got to know what the Bible says about us and about our enemy. We've got to know how to be victorious. We've got to know how to fight. What did Jesus do when he was in the wilderness? How did he fight? The temptation. He was being tempted by the devil himself, not a demon, the, the devil himself. All three times he said, it is written. It is written. It is written. In other words, devil, you're barking up the wrong tree. You have no power over me. You can tempt me, but guess what? It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. 
Every soldier must have his whole armor on, including his own sword that he knows how to use. Why is it two-edged? Because it sometimes cuts us just as much as, much as it does the enemy, but it, it, brings, it benefits us. And it, of course, is something that our enemy cannot stand up against. When the word is applied, it brings conviction and conversion to those who accept it and condemnation to those who reject it. It cuts both ways. There's a big difference between condemnation and conviction. But a day without the word is a day we step onto the battlefield without a sword. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God lasts forever. Our sword doesn't have to get lost. Our sword is not going to get broken as long as we have it in our hands. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word can be hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against God. And Jeremiah the prophet, one of my all-time favorite scriptures, he said, Thy word have I, have I hid in my heart, and it's like a fire shut up in my bones. He said it's the word of God that is like a fire shut up in his bones. The psalmist the very first psalm, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But what is his delight in? The law of the Lord, the word of God. And in this law doth he meditate day and night. What happens when you do that? You shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that brings forth his fruit in his season. Whatever he does shall prosper. We cannot neglect any piece of the armor of God. It's the whole armor. It's necessary. Every piece from head to toe is necessary to win this spiritual battle, to be successful Christians in the 21st century. And I'll close with this. General Eisenhower closed his address to the troops on the eve of D-Day with the words that are just as applicable to us today. He said this. He said, I have full confidence in your courage, your devotion to duty, and your skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Can we stand to our feet? The God who saved us has also given us what we need to be equipped to be successful. It is not His will that we be saved and then struggle and, and be defeated and live defeated lives the rest of our days until he comes. That's not what his will is. But he's given us the ability, he's given us what we have, what we have, uh, what we, he's given us access to what we need to win this battle. Would you bow your heads? Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful for the power of your word today. God, I feel your spirit here in a very real way. Lord, I pray that you would not let us sell ourselves short in this battle. Lord, you've saved your, your best soldiers for the last day's battle, and I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord. It's a responsibility. It's a weight of responsibility. But, Lord, we're, this church, the good people of POLR and Christians the world over are ready for the task, are up to the task. Lord, we've devoted ourselves more than ever to your word. We're studying to show ourselves approved. Lord, we are applying your word. We are delving into your spirit, into the depths of your spirit. I hear deep calling unto deep this morning. Here at the Pentecostals of Lee Road, you are going to do incredible things. You are going to show us signs, wonders, and miracles. You are going to confirm your word in many, many, many ways. God, I thank you for the, the elders that have gone before us. I thank you, Lord, for those who are here today who are with us. Who are, we're, we're shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm in battle. And, Lord, we are being victorious. God, we are victorious. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And, Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom not to neglect any piece of this whole armor that you've entrusted us with, that you've commanded us to stand, to put it on, to stand. And in the last days, we will stand victorious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you in a few minutes for worship.